Welcome to Lecture 7 of Advanced Topics in Quantum Information Theory. In this lecture, we will continue our discussion of non-local games, and specifically XOR games, focusing on a semi-definite programming formulation of the entangled bias of XOR games. Let's begin by recalling Cyrilson's theorem, which we proved in the previous lecture. Suppose that we have an XOR game G defined by question sets X and Y, a probability vector pi, and a function f that indicates whether Alice and Bob's answers should agree or disagree for each input pair. Recall that the entangled bias of g is the supremum of the values given by the formula that you see here, taken over all states rho and Hermitian contractions ax and by for all questions x and y of the forms that are indicated. Here, the scripted letters A and B denote arbitrary complex Euclidean spaces, representing the parts of the state rho held by Alice and Bob, respectively. Cyrilson's theorem tells us that the entangled bias is the supremum over all of the values taken by the formula on the right-hand side of the screen, where M is free to range over all real matrices, with rows indexed by the set X and columns indexed by the set Y, such that there exist matrices R and S having diagonal entries equal to 1 that make the entire block matrix shown on the screen positive semi-definite. This characterization of the entangled bias is very well suited to the formulation of a semi-definite program for the entangled bias, and explaining exactly what this semi-definite program looks like will be the first order of business for the lecture. In order to formally define a semi-definite program for the entangled bias of XOR games, let us begin by defining a few objects that will be useful for describing the semi-definite program. First, let us use the scripted letters X and Y to denote the complex Euclidean spaces indexed by the question sets X and Y. We'll use that notation for the entire lecture. Note that every positive semi-definite operator Z acting on the direct sum of X and Y can be written as a two by two block matrix or block operator as is shown here. This, of course, is exactly the form of the block matrices that appeared on the previous slide. In general, M doesn't necessarily need to have real number entries, but this won't be a concern at all, as we will see shortly. In fact, there's really no difference at all in terms of the final result and its implications, whether we work over the real numbers or the complex numbers, but we'll stick with the complex numbers just because that's the default in quantum information theory. And perhaps it's also informative to see that there really isn't any difference in this particular situation. Next, let delta denote the completely dephasing channel acting on the direct sum of x and y. Recall that this is the channel that leaves the diagonal entries of a matrix alone and zeroes out all of the off-diagonal entries of its argument. This channel will be used to enforce the constraint that the diagonal entries of the diagonal blocks R and S, as we just discussed, are all equal to 1. In particular, the constraint that delta of z is equal to the identity operator is equivalent to the requirement that z has all of its diagonal entries equal to 1. Finally, define d as is shown here, and let h be the Hermitian operator acting on the direct sum of x and y that we get by putting d and d adjoint in the off-diagonal blocks and the zero operator on the diagonal blocks multiplied by 1 half. H will be used to define the primal objective function for our semi-definite program, and it is the only part of the semi-definite program that actually depends upon the non-local game G being considered. And having defined these objects, here is the semi-definite program for the entangled bias that we will consider. We'll take a moment shortly to verify that the primal problem properly reflects the characterization of the entangled bias that is provided by Cyrilson's theorem. The dual is naturally obtained directly from the primal problem according to the general definition of the dual, but we will take a few moments to expand it somewhat so that it becomes more clear and easier to use. By the way, we do immediately see that strong duality holds and that the optimal values are always achieved in both the primal and the dual by Slater's theorem. Taking z to be equal to the identity operator yields a strictly feasible primal solution and taking w to be a sufficiently large scalar multiple of the identity operator yields a strictly feasible dual solution. 
Let's begin with the primal problem, and just for convenience, the general form of z along with the definitions of h and d are shown here as well. The objective value is equal to the inner product of d with the real part of m, meaning its entry-wise real part. This is because the inner product of h with z is equal to the average of the inner product of d with m and the inner product of d star with m star, which is the same thing as the inner product of d with the average of m and its entry-wise complex conjugate, given that d is real. Plugging in the definition of d yields the expression that you see here. As was already mentioned, z is feasible if and only if it is positive semi-definite, and r and s have diagonal entries equal to 1. So, if we were working over the real numbers, we would be done at this point. The optimal value would be equal to the entangled bias by Searleson's theorem, keeping in mind that it doesn't matter if r and s have real or complex number entries with respect to this characterization, as we discussed in the previous lecture. In the complex case, the optimal value of the primal form is clearly at least the entangled bias of G because the feasible operators include the ones for which M has real number entries. And we also see that the optimal value is no greater than the entangled bias by essentially the same reason why it doesn't matter if R and S are real or complex. More specifically, if Z is feasible, then so is Z transpose, and therefore so is the average of Z and Z transpose. And that's a matrix with real number entries that achieves the same objective value as z. Now let's turn our attention to the dual problem. Notice that because delta zeroes out all the off-diagonal entries of w, and the trace of w doesn't depend at all on the off-diagonal entries of w, there's really no point in worrying about the off-diagonal entries. So we might as well assume that w is diagonal. That is, we can assume that w has the form that's shown here, where diag of u and v with a capital D means the diagonal matrix with the entries of either u or v written on the diagonal. There's a factor of 1 half included here, which is just for convenience. We're free to scale u and v however we want, so there's nothing that prevents us from including the factor of 1 half, and it will simplify things in just a moment. If we now substitute this form of w into the objective function, we obtain the average of the sums over the entries of the vectors u and v. And if we substitute this form for w into the positive semidefinite constraint, it becomes equivalent to the block operator written here being positive semidefinite. And that is, of course, why we included the factor of 1 half, so that this would simplify. That's the form of the dual problem that we will work with going forward, but this is a good time to mention a fact that we will use later on. And that is that if u and v are optimal for the dual problem, then it must be the case that the two sums over the entries of u and the entries of v are equal. The reason for this is that if we have any choice of u and v that are dual feasible, and lambda is any positive real number, then multiplying u by lambda and dividing v by lambda must also be dual feasible. This is a general property concerning block operators being positive semidefinite. If you think about the dual objective value that would be obtained by multiplying u and dividing v by lambda, we get the expression written here. Now, it has to be the case that both of the sums are strictly positive because d is non-zero. So the block operator can't be positive semi-definite with either of its diagonal blocks being equal to zero. If we now minimize overall lambda, we find that the minimum occurs when lambda equals the square root of the ratio between the sums just by using basic calculus. And this is the unique value of lambda at which the minimum occurs. So if u and v are indeed optimal, then we have to have that the minimum here occurs when lambda equals 1, in which case the sums agree. Here's the final semi-definite program written out explicitly, with the primal being written in a way that directly reflects the characterization of the entangled bias offered by Searleson's theorem. These forms aren't as concise as the ones we started with, but they are in some sense more explicit, and we'll use them both, particularly the dual form of the problem, as the lecture continues. We'll cover two applications of this semi-definite programming formulation of the entangled bias of XOR games, and the first is to go back to the CHSH game. We can now verify that the entangled value of this game is cosine squared of pi over 8, as was stated in the previous lecture. 
Recall that the CHSH game is the XOR game defined by X, Y, Pi, and F as is shown here. X and Y are both the binary alphabet, Pi is uniform, and F is the AND function. The matrix D that appears in the semidefinite program for the entangled bias is therefore, as you see here, is proportional to the matrix associated with the Hadamard transform. We'll start by verifying that the entangled bias of the CHSH game, which is equal to the optimal value of the semidefinite program we just covered for this particular choice of an XOR game, is equal to 1 over square root of 2. As expected, we'll do this by exhibiting primal and dual feasible solutions that agree on the subjective value, so it must be the optimal value by weak duality. In the primal problem, we'll take M to be this matrix, which is the matrix associated with the Hadamard transform. It's obviously unitary, so its spectral norm equals 1. Therefore, if we put M and M adjoint, which happens to be equal to M in this case, on the off-diagonal blocks of a block operator, and we take R and S to be equal to the identity operator, then we'll obtain a positive semidefinite operator. This operator is positive semidefinite for any M having spectral norm at most 1. The diagonal entries of R and S are equal to 1, so this block matrix is primal feasible. The objective value it achieves is the inner product of D and M, which is equal to 1 over square root of 2. And so we have what we need. The primal objective value is at least 1 over square root of 2. In the dual problem, we can achieve the same value, 1 over square root of 2, by taking U and V to be these vectors. Plugging them into the dual constraint yields this matrix, which is positive semidefinite. The objective value we obtain is 1 half times the sum of the entries of u and v, which is 1 over square root of 2. So, having obtained the value 1 over square root of 2 in the primal and the dual, we have that this value is optimal, and so it is the entangled bias of the CHSH game. This means that the value of the CHSH game is 1 half plus 1 half times 1 over square root of 2, which is equal to cosine squared of pi over 8, as claimed. Naturally, you can use the semidefinite program to calculate or approximate the value of any XOR game you might wish to consider. The CHSH game is just one example, albeit a very important one. For the second application of the semidefinite programming formulation of the entangled bias of XOR games, we'll need to discuss a few concepts beginning with the AND of non-local games. Suppose that G1 through Gn are any non-local games, not necessarily the same, they can be arbitrary. We'll assume that these games are described in the usual way, but we'll put a subscript on each one of the relevant objects to indicate which of the end games it refers to. We define the AND of these end games to be the single non-local game, where the question and answer sets are Cartesian products of the original question and answer sets for the end games, and the probability vector pi and the predicate v are defined as you see written here. The way you can think about this new game is that the referee behaves as if it's playing the n separate games independently in parallel. It independently picks question pairs x1, y1 through xn, yn according to pi1 through pi n, and then it simultaneously sends x1 through xn to Alice and y1 to yn to Bob. Alice and Bob must reply with answers a1 through an and b1 through bn respectively, and they win if and only if their answers would have won in every single one of the games G1 through Gn. They have to win them all in order to win the new game. Now, when you think about this new game, the AND of G1 through Gn, it is important to realize that although the referee is essentially treating the end games as being independent, nothing says that Alice and Bob have to respect the independence of these games. We talk about classical strategies and entangled strategies as before, but these sorts of strategies are not required in any way to treat the games G1 through Gn as if they are independent or separate. A very natural question to ask in light of the previous definition is how the value of the AND of a collection of non-local games compares with the values of the individual games, and specifically whether or not Alice and Bob can get any advantage out of not treating the individual games independently. The answer is that they can, and the FFL game demonstrates that this is so in a pretty spectacular fashion. And that's what makes this particular game so interesting. As was stated in the previous lecture, the classical value of the FFL game is two-thirds. And remarkably, the AND of this game with itself also has value two-thirds, as opposed to four-ninths, which is the best winning probability for Alice and Bob 
if they treat the two instances of the game completely independently. The way that Alice and Bob can achieve the winning probability of two-thirds in the and of these two instances is to use the deterministic strategy where they both answer by simply swapping the two question bits that they receive. So f of x1x2 equals x2x1, and similarly for g. And if you think about whether or not this particular strategy wins or loses in either of the two individual game instances, you'll see that the condition is the same for both. It must be that x1 or x2 is different from y1 or y2. Thus, this strategy is either going to win in both instances or lose in both instances. Looking now at the probability that this condition is met, we find that it holds with probability two-thirds. We can simply consider all the possible question pairs and count the ones that lead to a win or to a loss, and we obtain probability two-thirds to win. It's simple, but quite surprising, really. In general, what this example illustrates is that the classical value of the AND of a collection of non-local games is not always equal to the product of the values of the individual games. We will always have that the value of the AND of G1 through GN is at least the product of the values G1 through GN, because Alice and Bob are always free to treat the individual games independently, and if they do that optimally, then that is the probability that they will win. But sometimes they can do better by correlating the games. By the way, exactly the same phenomenon does happen in the case of the entangled value, and again, the FFL game provides an example. Although we haven't analyzed the entangled value of the FFL game, it is again equal to two-thirds, and also, once again, the entangled value of the AND of the FFL game with itself is two-thirds. So this isn't a phenomenon that's specific to the classical value, it can also happen for the entangled value. However, this phenomenon cannot happen for the entangled value of XOR games. That is, for any choice of XOR games G1 through GN, the entangled value of the AND of G1 through GN is always equal to the product of the entangled values of G1 through GN. So there is never any advantage for Alice and Bob to correlate their strategies across individual game instances in the AND of any collection of XOR games in the case of entangled strategies. By the way, this statement is not true for the classical value of XOR games. It's a unique feature of the entangled value of the AND of XOR games. This feature is sometimes referred to as strong parallel repetition or perfect parallel repetition. In particular, if we take the AND of a given XOR game G with itself n times, then the entangled value of the resulting game will be equal to the value of the original game to the power n. In some settings, this is a useful property to have, but we won't discuss this, and instead we'll focus on proving the statement at the top of the screen. As I've already suggested, we're going to use our semi-definite program for the entangled bias of XOR games to prove that the entangled value of XOR games has the strong parallel repetition property. This won't be straightforward, though, because the AND of two or more XOR games is no longer an XOR game, simply because the answer sets aren't binary values anymore. So to help us to achieve the result we're going for, we're going to introduce a new concept, which is the XOR of two or more XOR games. We can start by defining what we mean by the XOR of just two XOR games, G1 and G2. So suppose G1 and G2 are two arbitrarily chosen XOR games. As usual, these games are described by question sets, probability vectors, and binary valued functions, and will follow a similar naming convention to what we used before in the case of the AND, simply by subscripting sets, vectors, and functions with 1 and 2 to indicate which game we're talking about. The XOR of G1 and G2 will be an XOR game, and specifically, it's the XOR game where the question sets are Cartesian products of the original question sets, and the probability vector is described as you see here, similar to what we did when defining the AND of non-local games. And finally, the new binary valued function f is obtained by taking the value of the two original functions and XORing them together. In words, the way you can think about the XOR of G1 and G2 is that the referee first independently chooses question pairs x1, y1, and x2, y2, according to pi1 and pi2, and then sends x1, x2 to Alice, and y1, y2 to Bob, 
and then they have to answer binary values, as always, for an XOR game. They win if their answers are consistent with the XOR of any choice of answers that would have won in both of the original two games. That is, if Alice answers A and Bob answers B, then as long as there exist binary values A1, A2, B1, and B2, for which A equals A1 XOR A2, B equals B1 XOR B2, and A1 B1 and A2 B2 would have won in G1 and G2 respectively, then they win, and otherwise they lose. Once we've defined the XOR of two XOR games in this way, we can define the XOR of any collection of XOR games simply by iterating the definition or generalizing it in the most natural way. The two definitions are equivalent. Now, for any two XOR games, G1 and G2, it is the case that the entangled bias of the XOR of G1 and G2 is at least the product of the entangled biases of G1 and G2. If Alice and Bob play the two individual games independently and optimally with entangled strategies, and then answer according to the XOR of the answers that they would have given for G1 and G2, then they'll achieve an entangled bias that is equal to the product of the entangled biases of G1 and G2. What we'll prove next is that this is, in fact, the best that they can hope to do. That is, the entangled bias of the XOR of G1 and G2 is always equal to the product of the entangled biases of G1 and G2. And we'll prove this using semi-definite programming duality. Specifically, consider the dual form of the semi-definite program from earlier in the lecture for both G1 and G2, and suppose that U1V1 is optimal for the semi-definite program for G1, and U2V2 is optimal for the semi-definite program for G2. And at this point, let us recall the fact that we noted earlier, which is that because these vectors represent optimal solutions, we know that we have the equalities shown here. The sum of the entries of U1 and V1 agree, as do the sum of the entries of U2 and V2. Because the XOR of G1 and G2 is an XOR game, we can think about the dual form of the semi-definite program for it, which is written here. Everything here is straightforward, except for perhaps the fact that we have D1 tensor D2 in the off-diagonal blocks, where of course D1 and D2 are the matrices defined as before by G1 and G2. But it isn't difficult to check that this is what we get from the definition of the XOR of XOR games. What we will do now is to conclude that by taking U to be the tensor product of U1 and U2, and taking V to be the tensor product of V1 and V2, gives us a feasible solution to this problem. This follows from a more general fact, which is that if we have two positive semi-definite block matrices, as shown here, and we tensor together the blocks to form a new block matrix, then this new block matrix will also be positive semi-definite. One way to prove this is to consider the tensor product of the two block matrices, which will be a much larger matrix than the one we're interested in, and then to convince yourself that the matrix we do care about is a principal submatrix of this larger matrix. And anytime we take a principal submatrix of a positive semi-definite matrix, we get another positive semi-definite matrix. And from this fact, we conclude that the block matrix shown here is positive semi-definite. It's almost what we want. The diagonal blocks are correct, as the tensor product of the diagonal matrices corresponding to two vectors is equal to the diagonal matrix corresponding to the tensor product of the vectors. We're missing a minus sign in the off-diagonal blocks because the two minus signs we had for the original block matrices canceled one another out. But you can always change the sign of the off-diagonal blocks of a two-by-two two block matrix without changing whether or not it's positive semi-definite. One way to see that is shown here by conjugating by the diagonal matrix with an identity in the first diagonal block and a negative identity in the second diagonal block, for instance, we effectively inject the minus sign into the off diagonal blocks while preserving the positive semi-definite property of the block matrix. What we've succeeded in showing is that by taking U to be U1 tensor U2 and V to be V1 tensor V2 is dual feasible for the semi-definite program corresponding to the entangled bias of G1 XOR G2. It remains to consider the objective value achieved by this solution.
using the fact that the sum over the entries of u1 and v1 are the same, being equal to the entangled bias of g1, and likewise for u2 and v2, we find that the objective value is in fact the product of the entangled biases of g1 and g2. It follows that the entangled bias of g1 xor g2 is at most the product of the entangled biases of g1 and g2, and we already know that the inequality holds in the other direction, as we noted when we defined the XOR of XOR games. We obtain the result we're aiming for. The entangled bias of G1 XOR G2 is equal to the product of the entangled biases of G1 and G2. Naturally, we can apply this fact iteratively to conclude that the entangled bias of the XOR of any collection of XOR games is equal to the product of the entangled biases of those games. Now we have everything we need to prove that the strong parallel repetition property holds for the entangled value of XOR games. We already observed that the entangled value of the AND of XOR games G1 through GN is at least the product of the entangled value of those games individually, and it remains to prove the reverse inequality. The argument through which we will prove this does make use of the fact that the entangled bias of the XOR of XOR games is multiplicative, as we just proved, but aside from this fact, the argument doesn't actually have anything to do specifically with quantum information, as we will see. Suppose that G1 through Gn are XR games, and consider any strategy whatsoever for the AND of these games, so that Alice somehow answers X1 through Xn with A1 through An, and likewise Bob answers Y1 through Yn with B1 through Bn. We may then think about how this strategy would perform if it were applied in a natural way to the XOR of some subset of those games, meaning that Alice answers this new XOR game by XORing her answers in the positions corresponding to the subset over which we're taking the XOR, and likewise for Bob. There is, by the way, a small technicality here, which is that in this new XOR game, Alice and Bob don't actually receive the questions corresponding to the games not included in the XOR. But we can simply imagine that Alice and Bob use shared randomness to generate these questions for themselves, and they need these other questions in order to apply the strategy for the AND of G1 through GN that we started with. To be a bit more precise, let's imagine that we have a collection of random variables, including x1 through xn and y1 through yn, that represent the referee's random selection for these questions, and a1 through an and b1 through bn, which represent Alice and Bob's answers to these questions, which are somehow determined by the strategy for the and of g1 through gn that we start with. We can also define random variables z1 through zn, as is written here. These random variables indicate whether or not Alice and Bob win in the corresponding XOR game. 0 indicates a win, and 1 indicates a loss, because a sub k xor b sub k must equal f sub k of x sub k y sub k in order for them to win game g sub k. Thus, the probability that they win game g sub k minus the probability that they lose is simply the expected value of negative 1 to the power z sub k. More generally, making use of exactly these same random variables, we can express the probability that Alice and Bob win the XOR game where we take the x over over some subset of the games g1 through gn as the expected value of negative 1 to the power given by the sum over the same subset of the random variables z1 through zn. But this value is simply the bias of the xor game corresponding to the xor over whatever subset of the original xor games we're talking about. And under the assumption that the original strategy for the and of g1 through gn is an entangled strategy, we have an upper bound for this bias, which is simply the product of the biases for the individual games. And thus, we can bound the probability that the original strategy wins the AND of G1 through GN in the following way. The probability that the strategy wins this game is, by the definition of the random variables Z1 through Zn, equal to the probability that every one of these random variables is equal to zero because each one is zero when Alice and Bob win the corresponding game, and in order to win the AND of the games, they need to win them all. This value is exactly the same as the expected value of the product written here, 
if any one of the random variables z1 through zn is 1, then the product equals 0, and otherwise the product equals 1. So the expected value coincides precisely with the probability that the random variables are all equal to 0. We can now expand the product and use the linearity of expectation to arrive at the expression written here, and then apply the upper bound that we just discussed. Each of the expected values represents the bias of some entangled strategy for the XOR game of some collection of the original games. And this is, at most, the product of the biases. We can now reverse direction, so to speak, and express this formula as a product, as is shown here, which evaluates directly to the product of the entangled values of G1 through Gn, and that's it. We've proved that the entangled value of the AND of G1 through Gn is at most the product of the values. Given that we already have the reverse inequality, we've proved what we wanted to prove, which is that the entangled value of the AND of G1 through Gn is equal to the product of the entangled values of these games. That's all for this lecture. As always, questions, comments, and corrections are welcome.